Welcome to this session, ladies and gentlemen, on scaling up disaster risk reduction in humanitarian action. The two subjects that were initially thought to be independent of each other and were conduct being conducted in silos. But that's why we are here. And that is the whole essence of disaster risk reduction. Now, this session will be uh, discussing humanitarian action through the ethic of prevention and long-termism. Now, the speakers are regional and global experts on the subjects and leaders of important organizations in the fields of disaster risk reduction and humanitarian action. May I welcome the session moderator, who is also an expert in this space. This is Nadia, El Nadia Ellis Geteka. She is Protection Cluster Co-Coordinator with the Norwegian Refugee Council in Mali. Nadia, karibu sana. Hello, um, good morning everyone, uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us uh, from. I'm very happy to welcome you into this uh, pre-event of the 8th Africa Regional Platform for Disaster Risk uh, Reduction. As they said, my name is Gateka Nadia Elis, and I'm the Protection Cluster Co-Coordinator in Mali. During this pre-event on scaling up uh, DRR in humanitarian action, uh, we are going to reflect together on the actual situation where we see humanitarian needs increasing uh, due to conflict, due to pandemics, and the consequences of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. But at the same time, we see that a uh, humanitarian crisis has been uh, treated as discrete event with actors uh, focusing on short-term results. But now we must put together effort from the humanitarian, the development and peace uh, actors together so that to address the root causes uh, of those uh, crises. Um, in this event, uh, we would like to thank UNDDRR, who is the lead of the event, and our collaborators, um, OCHA, uh, the Regional Office for West and Central Africa, the International uh, Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, and the Resident Coordinator uh, in uh, Madagascar. Before we start, I want to just to note that uh, you can uh, have um, interpretation um, in, on the bottom of your screen, you can see an interpretation uh, option where you can choose if you need interpretation, and you can also uh, write your questions in the chat. Uh, now, uh, I wanted uh, to introduce uh, my panelists and explain to you a little bit how this uh, session is going uh, to be um, uh, organized. Um, we will uh, start, uh, I will start first with the objective. We are going to try to identify the main challenges uh, posed by complex humanitarian crises on the African uh, continent with re regard to disaster risk and propose advocate for key pathways and action to strengthen disaster risk reduction. Um, and build resilience of vulnerable people and communities. We are going to highlight very good practices uh, from the field uh, on integration of DRR in humanitarian context and humanitarian development and peace uh, collaboration, including on disaster preparedness, uh, risk-informed response and recovery. We are going to discuss uh, country examples on specificities of certain regional and national contexts, uh, such as uh, Madagascar, South Sudan, uh, Niger, uh, Mozambique, uh, and so on, to highlight uh, the continent diversity and good practices. We are going to advocate for the application and rollout of the checklist on scaling up DRR in humanitarian context um, in the African region. And finally, we want to feed into the global platform thematic session 
on disaster risk in humanitarian uh, context. Now, coming back to um, my panelists, we are going first to have uh, Mrs. Uh, Paola Abrito, who is the chief of branch uh, for the intergovernmental processes, uh, disaster risk uh, uh, reduction. Um, uh, sorry, he is the chief of branch for the intergovernmental processes, interagency cooperation and partnership at the UNDDR, and she is based uh, in Geneva. Uh, in her current role, she supports intergovernmental processes in addressing disaster risk uh, reduction, uh, coordinates interagency efforts uh, in supporting the SENDAI framework implementation, and she builds uh, on partnership efforts toward risk informed uh, inter investment and actions. Uh, after her, we have uh, Mr. Adesh uh, Tripathi, the head of uh, disaster and crisis uh, prevention response and rehabilitation at the International Federation for Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies uh, in Kenya. We will uh, also have uh, Mrs. Benedetta uh, Dicintio from the uh, Regional uh, Office for West Africa and Central Africa at OCHA, and she is the Humanitarian Affairs Officers uh, officer head for the PCR uh, unit, which is the preparedness, coordination, and uh, response uh, unit. We will then have two great examples uh, from the field. We will uh, have uh, Dr. Banag Joshua uh, Dewal, the Director General of the Disaster Management uh, at the Ministry of Gender, Child Social Welfare, Humanitarian Affairs, and uh, Disaster Management in South Sudan. And we will uh, end with uh, Mr. Issa Sanogo, the UN resident coordinator uh, in Madagascar. Uh, as you can see, this is a great uh, panel, uh, and we will hope uh, we hope that you are going to learn a lot of things uh, from them. Uh, without any uh, other um, delay, we are going to give the floor to uh, Paola, who is going to present us the keynote uh, on the keynote speech on the checklist for scaling up DRR in humanitarian action. Thank you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to join you today at the Africa Regional Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction session on scaling up disaster risk reduction in humanitarian action. The call to strengthen prevention, reduce risks, and thereby reduce humanitarian needs has been there for many years now. But in the past couple of years, we have seen a new momentum and a new sense of urgency to move from words to action. The interest in disaster risk reduction is not surprising at this moment in time. The climate emergency and COVID-19 have demonstrated the change in nature, pace and scale of risk. Risk is interconnected and cascading. The pandemic and its social and economic implications on top of protracted conflict, climate-induced drought and ongoing health emergencies has thrown millions of people back into poverty. Demographic changes and unsustainable development choices mean that today more people than ever are in arms way. As a result, in Sub-Saharan Africa, humanitarian needs are rising and are expected to increase further in 2021. We need to take action to prevent crises, to prepare better for complex risks that have rippled effect across sectors and stop institutions from performing their central role. We have the evidence that prevention saves lives, as well as costs. And yet, we are missing key opportunities to ensure that humanitarian action is informed by risk. It is simply not happening as a default approach and not fast enough to what we are faced with. So what do we miss? The no, the when, certainly the why is clear. I sometimes still hear from humanitarian actors, we don't do disaster risk reduction, that's with development agency. 
And development agencies saying humanitarian actors are the one to look into disasters considerations. However, we have and are learning the hard way that reducing disaster risk is everyone's business. There is an urgent need for humanitarian development and peace building actors to have a shared understanding and a comprehensive whole system response to climate and disaster risk and how this relates to conflict in protracted crisis. Joint up and comprehensive risk analysis and greater cooperation across the humanitarian development nexus is the very basis for addressing disaster risk in this context. It is also highlighted in the 2020 Quadriennial Comprehensive Policy Review, which is the mechanism through which the General Assembly assesses the effectiveness, efficiency, coherence and impact of UN operational activities to support countries in their development efforts. The adopted resolutions recognizes that development, disaster risk reduction and humanitarian action, as well as sustaining peace, is fundamental to most efficiently and effectively addressing needs and attaining the sustainable development goals. This is why breaking down silos and looking at what each of us can do differently to infuse disaster prevention is a must. This is also why UNDRR with OCHA and other partners have consulted and developed a checklist on scaling up disaster risk reduction in humanitarian action launched earlier this year. The checklist is a practical tool to ensure that humanitarian action goes hand in hand with prevention. It calls for strengthened joint risk analysis, collaboration between humanitarian development and peace actors around joint disaster risk reduction goals, but also more flexible and layered financing for reducing risks from across humanitarian and development funding streams. The checklist also identified emerging good practices. Many of them are in Africa. Local actors are driving solutions to reduce vulnerability and overall risk and needs. Advances in anticipatory action and forecast-based financing are being rolled out, for example, in Somalia, Ethiopia and Niger. As called for in the checklist, we also see humanitarian and development actors working more together to reduce disaster risk. In Burkina Faso, Mauritania and South Sudan, just to name a few, humanitarian and development actors are agreeing on joint goals to prevent crisis and address the drivers of humanitarian needs. As highlighted in the checklist, we need more of these solutions and we need them faster. Better access to risk knowledge, more support to local -led solutions, and linking anticipatory action to national and local disaster risk reduction strategies will be important to help reduce risk in long term. Besides supporting capacity to risk inform humanitarian action through a training package available by the end of the year, UNDRR is also working with IOM, UNICEF, UNDP, and OCHA and other partners to map capacity gaps on disaster risk reduction among humanitarian actors and to work out joint strategies to address these gaps. Finally, let's not forget the long-term planning goes against basic human instinct. Behavioral economics shows that, humanitarian, that humans tend to overvalue short-term benefits when compared with long-term well-being. So let's adopt the long-term thinking on these issues as the winning attitude. I very much look forward to our panel today. Thank you very much, uh, Paola. I really uh, um, agree with her presentation because uh, when we were doing our humanitarian program cycle workshop uh, in Mali, this is literally what happened. Uh, humanitarian did not agree uh, on the fact that they had to intervene or not on uh, natural uh, disaster, uh, which are some of, of our uh, priority shocks uh, here in uh, Mali, and some were saying uh, that it's the role of development actors, so she's really uh, on the point. And I do remember also when we were doing our uh, cluster evaluation uh, last year, um, emergency preparedness uh, were one of the 
uh, component we wanted to strengthen. So uh, looking into her intervention, I think that even DRR is something that we must in improve and we are waiting for uh, the capacity uh, building uh, tools to come out uh, as it will be very useful. Uh, now we are going to give the floor to Mr. Adesh Tripathi, who is going to uh, talk about IFRC supports uh, for national society to continually improve their local preparedness and uh, response capacity. Um, and they will present IFRC approach to disaster uh, and climate crisis, as well as some of uh, the examples on how DRR is scaled up uh, along with humanitarian actions. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Tripathi. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. A pleasure meeting your colleagues. Just uh, on conceptual part, uh, maybe you can see here uh, the, our approach. I think uh, our uh, previous presenter uh, also talked about how important to look into the planning aspect. So the, we look into disaster risk reduction, mitigation, climate action, and preparedness uh, throughout the approach. Even if we are doing the humanitarian response, I think that's the philosophy. That's the approach we need to do. So that's the approach, that's the implementation we need to do. So that uh, we just don't deliver some of the life saving and we don't forget. I think there are community residents helping people to prosper from the disaster and crisis is the main direction or main pathways for responsibility. So that's the approach we need. Maybe just for a couple of examples uh, to highlight here uh, in the big, uh, big picture. Uh, the IFRC currently supporting in Africa, sub saharan Africa, 49 Red Cross threat societies to do disaster response in essence. And in the last three years, we responded to 151 humanitarian response. Of course, COVID-19, Ebola, and all kind of protracted crises. Uh, if you look into it, every month we have a two to three big disaster and protracted crisis. To do. But uh, we are looking at this as a perfect opportunity to build uh, uh, or address the disaster risks and build the resilience. Uh, the first comes with our planning and the, the scenario planning and the prevention design is how we can contribute to resilience or a long term recovery and so that disaster risk reduction is already there by design, but, but not by the luxury, but by design. That's the one of the things I would want to share with you, colleagues. Then our most of the response are local-led response. In Africa, in 39 national societies, we have 12,000 branches and 1.1 million volunteers. They are the front line. Because the response is led by the uh, frontline volunteers, community people, and that already take into consideration of the uh, their, their future build back safer approach and uh, other their immediate resilience uh, actions that community can do. So that's one of the approach it is contributing. And in our policy wise, if we do any humanitarian response, we allocate minimum 10% of the budget for the disaster reduction. If we do the humanitarian action in Somalia, in our appeal, in our plan, there is minimum 10% budget is allocated for the disaster. Practical, by the way, in many of their cases, we get the money from the military response, and uh, the, if we miss the disaster risk reduction opportunity, then we are missing the big picture. We are missing their uh, long-term agenda, so that we... And at the same time, uh, we also look into... Uh, uh, the, what would be the 
green response or the climate smart response. We use the gas based intervention. We are promoting right now the climate charter. Many of the military organizations that they have shown great interest to be the part of charter. Do you know when we are doing the response to reduce our carbon footprint? And we need to really find the local humanitarian response so that most of the indirect consequences or indirect harm, harm will be uh, reduced. Then, uh, most important, maybe in the COVID-19 situation, very important to highlight, our response are integrated as a central theme of community engagement and accountability, gender protection and inclusion. And that helps community cohesiveness, really the local uh, women or children or the youth, uh, youth or the girls, they feel power and they are the driving um, the situation to uh, doing the response. And that uh, really builds the local resilience. So these are the big picture, I must say. Maybe let me take some of the examples uh, here to highlight. I'm uh, taking uh, some of the example from the national societies, how they are uh, responding. Uh, the, right now, the, maybe it's relevant to take example from Mozambique. We have the interim coordinator from Mozambique. Uh, you remember 2018 and 19, there were consecutive uh, cyclones and uh, the massive uh, destruction. And we took this opportunity to promote the anticipated reaction. Now, Mozambique Red Cross CDM has anticipated reaction. Before cyclone comes, they have money, they have a people ready, uh, and we are mobilized, but it is a small scale. Huh? It's not uh, the biggest, but there is the drive. We need to really acknowledge on that. And the Mozambique government has passed new disaster law, uh, and which is very much uh, disaster risk reduction management, very central to the community resilience building, which is a great development. And uh, we need to really congratulate many stakeholders uh, who are doing. And Kenya Red Cross, the event is uh, taking place in Kenya. In Anyway, uh, he is also adopting anticipated reaction. And Somalia is my colleagues uh, this uh, also highlight. Ethiopia and many, uh, even in Mali, Burkina Faso, they are taking anticipated reaction so that we don't need to wait that disaster to happen. Uh, but they are ready to respond and the local frontline will be And in Africa, the IFRC is supporting 21 national societies, national red cross societies. They are getting ready to continue planning training, simulation, uh, really getting ready for the localization of the aid. So 21 national society are doing, and that is a big along the military response. It is not the massive money we got. It is a really big along uh, around the military response. Then uh, climate smart livelihood uh, adaptation, if you can see the Red Cross in response, we are frontline, but at the same time, we are not neglecting the climate smart intervention on food security. And it is enabling our National Red Cross Education Societies to do in 28 uh, national societies, including Kenya, actually. It's a very impressive program here in Kenya. And in Burkina Faso, Mali, the, and uh, also Mauritania, the one group are doing a uh, much more climate uh, smart activities, which is a uh, mother club, uh, climate smart livelihood. Then, uh, Ethiopia, so Sudan, yeah, you know the complex crisis uh, when we are responding here. We are not forgetting the tree plantation and here, nature based solution, which is a great uh, intervention. And also using energy and uh, household items, solar panel uh, in the camp or in the host communities. Uh, these are the key examples uh, we are promoting. And uh, COVID 19, as I highlighted uh, earlier, 49 national societies in Africa, they are doing community engagement and And it is really relevant uh, when we are looking about the COVID transfer world. This is the main thing so we can learn for a scaling of disaster risk and uh, response. So uh, these, uh, these are the few highlights. Uh, in Mozambique, the early action protocol, if you just in this graphics, uh, they, do, they get the data. The government and we make a simple scenario planning and we do the positioning, we train the volunteers, and when the before the cyclone comes, budget is allocated, volunteers are deployed, uh, the household are getting assistance. Uh, it's, scale wise is small, but it's uh, it's symbolic value or its scalability is so high. I think uh, 
the humanitarian community and uh, development and disaster protection community need to keep as a center point, not as a distinct uh, uh, intervention. So these are the few things from my side, colleagues. Uh, if any additional things you would like to ask, I'm happy to take. I think I have a couple of seconds more. But uh, in my uh, personal experience, I have done all big disaster response globally. And the big disaster response is the perfect opportunity to build back safer, build back stronger, making community healthy and resilient. Many things can be done alongside the disasters. I stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Tripathi. Um, I heard that there was an issue on uh, the translation. Uh, the sound was not uh, also very stable on my side, but uh, I did understand uh, some uh, of the key points which are allocating budget for disaster risk reduction. Um, it's very important to have uh, humanitarian donors buy in. Uh, you talked about uh, localization and the need to uh, have locally led action uh, and community engagement. Uh, you, you did talk also also about using um, some uh, modalities such as uh, the cash um, modality for assistance and uh, taking into account uh, different um, issues around uh, protection, such as uh, protection, accountability, uh, gender and inclusion, uh, and uh, the importance of early warning uh, for DRR uh, and, all, and not only uh, for uh, conflicts. So uh, thank you very much. I, I hope the next sound um, will be better. Um, we are going to give the floor now to uh, Mrs. Benedetta Di Cincio from the regional office of OCHA. Uh, and she's uh, going to talk to us about uh, West and Central Africa ongoing actions. Um, uh, and uh, a case study uh, from Niger. Thank you and welcome, uh, Mrs. Dicintio. Good morning, everyone. My name is Benedetta and I'm the head of, of the Preparedness Coordination and Response Unit for OCHA Regional Office based in Dakar. I would like to sincerely thank you and the colleagues to invite us to this important event to allow us to share our experience and contribution on the scaling up of DRR in humanitarian action. And today we would like to share with you the case study from Niger with good example and good practice that we are recently reporting in the country. As you may know, the West and Central Africa region is, is facing one of the world's most complex challenges. The current humanitarian situation results from the, co the combination between ongoing conflict, violence, and the impact of the climate change and natural disaster. OCHA is currently up updating the figures for the global humanitarian overview. We have over 60, over 61 million people that we require humanitarian assistance and protection in 2022. 50 million people are displaced with an increase of 2 million people compared to last year. With regard to natural disaster in 2021, flooding affected over 1.2 million people in 13 countries of the region. Constant of the of the context of intervention and of the impact of climate change and natural disaster in the region, OCHA Regional Office is strongly and actively working in coordination with national government as well humanitarian actors and DRR partner to uh, support the strengthening of emergency preparedness capacity at the regional and the country level. Key example of this effort is the support that OCHA uh, regional office is providing to ECOVAS uh, since 2014. In details, we are providing punctual capacity building of disaster manager, manager and we are also supporting in the advocacy for the creation of one model agency for managing disaster.
In the country where OCHA has not its own office, we are working in support of the resident coordinator to ensure technical support to national authority on contingency planning, as for example, ongoing work that we are doing in Togo, Gambia, Mauritania. And through the CADRI platform, OCHA co coordinate with other UN agency member and partner of CADRI uh, to co facilitate the assessment of government DRR and emergency response capacity. Always at the country level, OCHA support the process for the development of DRR action plan through the support to NDMA authority and civil protection. As mentioned at the beginning, we would like to share with you today the concrete experience that we are reporting in Niger, where several efforts are ongoing to improve and to strengthen the coordination between DRR actors and humanitarian partners. As you may know, the Nigerian population is paying a heavy price for climate change and natural disaster. Drought and flooding are strongly affecting local community capacity to access essential service and basic needs. As per OCHA October 2021 data, more than 250,000 people have been recently affected by flooding, 77 people have been killed, and more than 70,000 have been destroyed. With the current the government is actively working in the development of several policy, national and sectoral strategy, as well as in the creation of coordination platform to ensure the valorization of joint effort between humanitarian and development actors. Key example of this effort is in 2015, the 2015, the establishment of the Civil Protection Agency and the development of the National Policy for the Humanitarian Action and Disaster Management. DRR policies has been developed and the revision has been done during this year. In 2018, always under the lead of the government, it has been established the high-level tripartite committee on the emergency development nexus approach. And recently, it has been the launching of the new way of working by the development of a country roadmap for the implementation of the nexus commitment. From an OJA perspective, at the country level, our team are closely supporting the government in the development of the policies, as well as they are supporting the humanitarian coordinator and the resident coordinator in the participation of the coordination platform and technical support and capacity building. With regards to the UN agency, in 2021, uh, Nigerian UN agency based in Niger, they have revised the framework of the achievement of 2030 sustainable development goals with the focus on climate change. The aim of this exercise was to monitor progress as well to jointly identify key action for the next step. Uh, finally, an Recent UN SERF allocation has been fully dedicated to the funding of anticipatory action. This is one of the concrete recent examples of the increased effort and increased commitment of humanitarian actors in the, improving, in the improvement of emergency preparedness, preparedness activities in the country at the regional level. The type of funding is very new. Unlike traditional humanitarian intervention that are implemented once a shock is effective, the UN SERF anticipatory action will aim to implement intervention before the arrival, the arrival of a shock to limit the impact on affected population. As showed and uh, briefly expressed by the concrete example from, uh, from Niger, a joint approach between emergency preparedness and disaster risk reduction represents a key opportunity to maximize the impact of ongoing action implemented by humanitarian and development actors. A key opportunity that needs to be supported and promoted by humanitarian development partners. In this, in this aim, key actions have been identified with 
Ocha colleague from in the field to strengthen the ongoing collaboration and coordination. Enhance the visibility of ongoing planned operation by concerned actors, as well as the work to be do to be done in the harmonization of the approaches and synergy all along the program cycle for humanitarian and development projects. A key point also to be raised is the need to scale up dedicated resources and funding for, in, for the development and the implementation of integrated pro projects aimed at strengthening the resilience capacity of the community at the national level and at the local level. An opportunity that humanitarian actors are uh, today committed to explore a committee to, to, to work on it. And it's, it's a, clear, uh, a, a clear opportunity to synchronize between short and long-term intervention and to valorize and value existing synergy between concerned actors in all the steps of the program cycle, starting from emergency preparedness up to the, to the response to affected population in the country. Thanks a lot. Thank you to Ocha colleagues. Uh, maybe if I can um, have like three takeaways. Is the import there is the importance of uh, technical support on national contingency planning and assessment of government DRR and response capacities, uh, which is very important. Um, we must strengthen the joint uh, approach between emergency preparedness and DRR. And um, I think this is the first time I heard about the anticipatory action surf and I uh, did understand that it is a pilot uh, action for the moment and uh, this could be one of the uh, response to the absence of gap um, on DRR and humanitarian action so we hope it will also be scaled up. Uh, now we have uh, 24 minutes left so without um, uh, uh, taking uh, more time we are going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Banak Shusua De, De Wal, uh, Director General of uh, Disaster Management Ministry, uh, Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management in South Sudan. Please welcome. Uh, th thank you, Nadia, and thank you for crafting the, uh, the name. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. the Minister of Gender is, uh, is, uh, is a different ministry at the moment, so based on the current set up of the institution in South Sudan. Uh, I once again give my thanks to UNDR uh, for giving this opportunity to the Republic of South Sudan to be part and person uh, in these important uh, panel discussions uh, on scaling up uh, DRR um, in uh, humanitarian action. As you are all aware, uh, South Sudan is, uh, is an emerging country, just to be independent in 2011, 20, uh, 11, and uh, we have been uh, struggling with uh, setting up institutions uh, to cope with the uh, the amount of uh, 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 disasters and conflict that has has marred the country for a long time. Our experience uh, uh, goes back to 50 years, and um, uh, before we separate from Sudan, and the. Um, the main action on ground uh, has been the delivery of relief or humanitarian action, uh, to put it that way. That there has never been uh, an approach to link um, the emergency uh, situation with the development because the, uh, there were a massive uh, displacement of many people and there was an intersection of the climate change issues and uh, natural hazards, uh, conflict, and an epidemic and pandemic now like the COVID-19. Uh, some years back, South Sudan also experienced the Ebola virus, so where many of you are aware of this. And with the new nation struggling to put up or to put in place structures, uh, for the other governance. It has been a big challenge to 
to align the emergency interventions and, uh, and sustainable development. This is because the, the responsibilities of the various institutions have not been uh, identified. So when, when there is a, a disaster, really, the roles of each institution become a, a problem, problematic. Leave alone the relationship between the non-state actors and the government. So in the absence of the framework or an institution that governs the DRR humanitarian action in the country, it makes the humanitarian action and development more complex. Uh, our experience is that uh, this year and the last, for the last three years, and uh, because the frequency of disasters uh, increased, we had now flood for the last three years, and the worst of them is uh, last year and this year. I happened to visit the, one of the uh, in, uh, affected population in Maban County in northern, Upper, in northern Upper Nile, whereby the community participation uh, did a very participatory work by digging a, a dike to, to protect the, the town from the effect of uh, flooding. But again, now came the question of urbanization. So if the planning of the, gov of the government at national level and the communities are not coordinated well, then even the effort that are being done by the community could be a waste. Because communities try to, to do what they think is right for themselves and, and right for the people and for the next generations. Now, when the urbanization come in, also interfere. So they told me that they, they dig a one mile or two miles uh, dike, but when urbanization came in, the government also came and broke the dike and now when the water from the river flow came, it affected their communities. So there must be an element of coordination between this or among these stakeholders to ensure that relief and humanitarian action and development and DRR are really aligned to the, and are really put in place. And then the, I, the, 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 the plans are, that are put at the, at the lower level communities should not be overlooked by the national government. Uh, one of the key important things that we would like to share with you is that humanitarian action has been a tradition approach. It has been a traditional philosophy. We want to save life. We want to save life because these are, we are managing crises. It has never combined long-term sustainable development goal uh, with the humanitarian action because this is also contingent on the resources available within the organization that are providing humanitarian action and also the priorities of the national government. So if these two things are not aligned, uh, we feel that also there'll be a waste of resources and we are not going to attain any, any profit from, the, from integrating the actions, humanitarian actions and DRR. One last thing, I think because of time also, I'm aware of that, is that my government, especially the national government in South Sudan, the issue of a multi-hazard early warning that addresses the underlying issues. We most, we're more focused on the flooding, drought, uh, conflict, pandemic like, like the COVID-19 pandemic, but also forgetting the underlying vulnerabilities of the communities that could, be, could also a trigger of increasing the vulnerability of the people affected by, by hazards. So therefore, it is very important when we are identifying the risk, and which is, this is the intro point, identifying the risk within the community, with the participation of the community, and with the planning and preparedness and prevention, I think integrating these issues together is something that we can see uh, a green light or a light in the, in the, in the end of uh, the mile we want to work in terms of uh, combining DRR with the humanitarian action. So my last point is, for us as nations, we ensure that humanitarian action and DRR goes hand to hand, or go hand to hand rather, 
we better understand the needs and priorities of the national government and the priorities of the communities we are trying to serve if we have to do things better than the traditional way of combining humanitarian action and DRR. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dewa. Um, as you mentioned, um, uh, we are learning a lot about also challenges in the DRR work. Like uh, you said, there is no approach to link humanitarian and development side uh, of work in South Sudan. There is an absence of framework, uh, but there are also uh, good practices like the community who came together to try to find a solution. But we definitely need to coordinate a community work with uh, government planning and and combined all of these with long-term uh, development uh, goals uh, while taking into consideration uh, underlying uh, vulnerabilities that community already have. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to give the floor to our last panelist, uh, Mr. Isa Sanogo, the UN resident coordinator in Madagascar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I would start by echoing what uh, Dr. Um, Banak just said. It's important that uh, we integrate uh, DRR into humanitarian action. In the case of Madagascar, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a no-brainer. It's a must, simply because the country is uh, very confronted with multiple disasters. It's a country that is drought-prone, cyclone prone, flood prone, and unfortunately even uh, health epidemic prone. We have many examples. And as he, he also said, it's, uh, it's very clear that uh, uh, the climate issues are going to become more and more frequent. And therefore, I think we need to start looking at integrating uh, DRR more uh, 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 forcefully into our, our responses. I can take the example of uh, the south of Madagascar, which is now going through a drought, which has never been heard of for the last 40 years. So for the last three years, we have been going through a drought, which is creating a humanitarian situation, which is now known on the world uh, scene as one of the rare climate-related famine-like situation. So just to, to come back to some of the things I think we, we are looking at in terms of how DRR is being integrated in uh, uh, humanitarian action, I would, I would like to offer three areas of action. The first one is definitely around uh, uh, you, uh, emergency preparedness, which I think is very uh, important. Madagascar is a place where you have a lot of experience from the past regarding emergency preparedness. And I'm going to give you a few examples. But the bottom line here is really to reactivate them, maintain them, and sustain them. Um, you may know, and I said it in another forum uh, before, 15 years ago, uh, Madagascar had uh, a very good uh, drought early warning system. It was uh, reviewed five years ago, but unfortunately, uh, the system is on standby. So it needs to be uh, reactivated, uh, given that we are now facing a drought which is uh, bringing famine, almost. Uh, this, I think uh, Adesh also mentioned the necessity to look at early warning systems at the community level. Madagascar is a place where you do have many early warning systems at community levels, especially in vulnerable areas. But again, the issue there is to ensure that we coordinate, we make sure that it's sustained, but also we make sure that it's owned by uh, the government and the national actors so that uh, uh, those systems can really play the role they are meant to do in terms of uh, saving lives and alleviating the suffering from the people. 
I'll give another example. Uh, Ten years back, uh, Madagascar was one of the first countries to have uh, uh, a national plan for climate change. In 2012, the first contingency plan for drought was also produced in, uh, in Madagascar. The latest uh, drought contingency plan actually includes early action and resilience. On a different uh, perspective regarding things like chemical accident prevention, for instance, Madagascar has been working on those aspects since 2013 with the help of UNOCHA as well as UNEP. And in 2015, Madagascar actually got the International Green Star Award for prevention and preparedness uh, to chemical uh, hazards. And as I'm speaking now, the review and test of uh, the contingency plans for cyclones and, uh, and floods are also ongoing. Someone also mentioned the fact that uh, there is a surf anticipatory uh, action which is in preparation. It's the same here as well. We have a surf anticipatory action being prepared because we are faced sometimes with plague, which is an area that is probably absent elsewhere. Now, it's clear that another second area of actions is the necessity for us to work together. And uh, the only together uh, hashtag of 2021 is something that is referring to the fact that uh, it is only with enhancing the international cooperation with, uh, in support to national priorities that we will definitely succeed in addressing some of the risks and also save more lives and livelihoods. And I think there are a number of opportunities here. Uh, next week, we are getting the cadre mission, which is coming to help us map out uh, the early warning systems and also to see at the stage at which they are functioning so that we can, we can effectively reactivate them, which has been the channel through which uh, this request came but we are working very hard on that to make sure that we progress. And I think there is also a real opportunity here in Madagascar, which is uh, the um, humanitarian platform, which uh, is linked to this private sector. It's a very dynamic one which we can leverage, in addition to the fact that uh, the government just launched the uh, national platform for disaster risk reduction. So all those uh, opportunities where I think uh, we can benefit from expertise from uh, UNDRR to help us uh, really provide the support the government needs so that we can make a difference. The last thing I would also add, which was mentioned by colleagues, uh, my predecessors, is the necessity to link humanitarian development and peace, or you call it a resilience nexus together we have a chance to use our cooperation framework whereby we have that aspect as a programming principle and we are going to activate it so that we can really link humanitarian to development and peace and resilience. Because as someone said, it's everybody's business. And if we don't do that, obviously we'll keep the silos. And uh, to complete uh, my five minutes, I would say that it is also very essential that we, uh, we have systematic lessons learning exercises when it comes to uh, disaster risk reduction into humanitarian uh, responses because it's only through that kind of lesson learning exercises that we will really be able to factor in systematically this disaster risk reduction aspect as we uh, plan to deploy not only the humanitarian responses, but also the development responses altogether. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Sanovo. Um, we have only seven minutes left. I'm just going to come back to maybe uh, three, three things. The importance to maintain the systems uh, that you have already put in place uh, to work together uh, with international cooperation to support national uh, priorities and the importance 
uh, to have uh, the nexus, uh, humanitarian peace and devel development as programming uh, principle. Now uh, I'm going to look into the chat uh, to see if there are some uh, questions that we can answer. Um, we have one for Ocha, maybe if uh, for Tini is there. Uh, someone would like to know, uh, I would like to know uh, the interaction of OCHA with uh, research in institutions, university for the management and prevention of risk in Niger. Thank you very much for the question. I hope the sound is good. Can you please confirm? Yeah, it, okay. it's clear. Thank you. All right. Um, the interaction of OCHA with research um, institutes uh, regarding uh, DRR in Niger um, is uh, something that is uh, in the in the plans. Um, as we as mentioned in the presentation, we have a very good uh, example of. Uh, the nexus led by the government and uh, as part of that uh, one of the activities is to um, work closer with research institutes to, inf to better inform uh, our actions and planning. I hope that answers quickly the question. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Um, I hope that uh, uh, the question is answered. We have another question in the chat. Um, maybe uh, everyone, uh, every panelist can see if they can answer it. Data is an important resource. How are you navigating the political hurdles with regards to data collection and uh, dissemination? We did talk about um, uh, um, the uh, mapping, uh, we did talk about early warning system, uh, but that showed that there is a lot of uh, work to do in relation to data collection uh, and dissemination, but how can we uh, take into consideration also the, the political side? I don't know if any, anyone wants to jump in. Yes, can I try that? Maybe. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Yeah, this Please is, go on. This is yeah, uh, I think that's a good question because one of the um, one of the bottleneck in the in the reporting to the Sunday Monitor uh, by national government, especially the um, member states, is the question of uh, data. Uh, data collections is uh, is is uh, is uh, one side, and data analysis and storage and dissemination is another. Sometimes you get you get data available. Okay, the main issue with us is that no access to data because of the capacities, because of other other uh, important uh, uh, challenges. But once we have the data, it is very important for us to to analyze the data because they they feed us. They give us information about the trend, about the, the history, about what we should be doing better in the in the future. So I think data collection. Uh, and data storage and dissemination has also political implications. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, in South Sudan, sometimes we have the uh, we have the IPC uh, reports, and the IPC reports uh, would say, for example, the national government would say we have about five pe five million people who are in need of uh, food assistance. But when you match this figure with the reality on ground you may find that the figures are more than what actually has been uh, indicated by, by, the, by, 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 by the politician. So politicians can say something different, but the IPC is the technical, technical body capacitated which uh, store data, collect data, and analyze them. And this is where now South Sudan is relying on the IPC report in terms of avoiding any political connotation or any political uh, wrangling when it comes to the question of data. So politics is there, but again, IPC is our source of information. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So it's very important to have like a common system agreed with everyone where we can use and uh, when we can uh, collect and store the data so everyone is on the same page. Uh, maybe one uh, last question. We just have two minutes 
minute left and we are going to have also the uh, final uh, key messages. But is anyone um, able to answer how can joint analysis, flexible finance and uh, multi-hazard approaches of actors across the nexus address the gap in the silo of siloed DRR planning and financing? Because this is uh, something that almost all actors were talking about, maybe in 30 seconds. If I may, just to say uh, yes. quickly that um, in terms of joint analysis, what we are trying to do here is really to, to get uh, most of the actors out together to do uh, multiple vulnerability analysis before we even start the programming. And in the context of uh, doing the uh, humanitarian development and peace nexus, we are deploying the agencies to really conduct that joint analysis together. And once this is done, we can actually see how uh, the different responses, be they urgent or development or resilience related, can be synchronized together from a planning point of view as well as an implementing uh, point of view. So that's how we are trying to approach it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sanogo. So it's very important to continue this joint analysis and planning around the DRR process. Um, the second key message is uh, to continue to collect the set of good practices in the Africa region uh, so that um, it can be, we can improve uh, DRR approach on the African continent because there are multiple examples of good practices and we, that we could learn uh, from. And last, there is a need to uh, collect to connect the interest of donors, humanitarian and development agencies, community and state mem member states, demonstrating ways of treating risk drivers differently, linking analyses, uh, focusing on vulnerability reduction, as most of you said, and tackling siloed uh, financing and planning. So thank you very much to all the uh, panelists and the participants. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Goodbye and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.